me apart, talk with, with Todd, and uh, he will share his heart with you. I am thankful that uh, we have a house full with 34 women from the church gone on a retreat. Well, 33. One of them did not go. She's here this morning. But there's 33 women that's gone on the ladies' retreat. And from what I have heard, they are having a wonderful, wonderful time, spiritually growing. Uh, my wife said she's laughed so hard that she thinks one of her ribs may be loose now. So um, that's okay. I'll take care of her when she gets home. Amen. Amen. This morning, I'm honored to introduce to you Jim and Renee Larson. Uh, they've been a part of this church, and this church has been a part of their ministry for many years. Uh, last year, when we sent the nearly $8,000 that we had raised by your giving, by your doing, to help put a well in, um, they're here this morning to share about the well, to share about their ministry. Jim's going to preach the word, and uh, we're just going to be blessed. Amen? Amen? So give a round of appreciation. You want me to speak about you, Jordan, and your lovely wife? No, that's okay. And his, his son and daughter-in-law came as well. So if you're a guest, there's a green card out in front of you. Feel free to fill that out. Turn it in. We'd love to stay connected with you. And uh, it's just a blessed time in the Lord. Jim, Renee, if those two chairs can be brought up. Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you so much. Thanks for opening the door here and allowing us to minister and share, give updates to what God is doing. Am I on? You're on. Okay. Turn Terrific. the monitor up for <laughs> All right. Well, I am Renee Larson, and um, as Pastor Jay said, um, we're just so thankful for the relationship we've had with Spirit of Life over the years. We've got some praise reports to share with you. Everybody loves some good news, right? Yeah. We need some good news. There's so much bad news these days. You turn on the TV, and it's all it is, but you know, God's doing great things. So be encouraged. He is on the move. Well, the first thing I want to share with you is some good news about the Water Project, Okay. Currently, as of right now, there are 27 families that have clean water being delivered to their front door through this water distribution system and well that Spirit of Life was a part of. Amen? That is good news. They never had water before. Never. Since the community's been actually founded 12 years ago, no water. Can you imagine? So we're going to just show a little video, and I'm just going to talk while this video is going on. So you can be introduced to the community of Nueva Esperanza. The translation is New Hope. Do you love that or what? Praise God, because you have brought new hope to this community. So as this is playing, you're going to see the very streets of um, New Hope and what it looks like in that community. There we are just coming into the community. There's a big process that takes place with putting in a water project, lots of community meetings, you'll see some of that, and getting collaboration amongst the community members, training them about the maintenance of the well and what will need to be done to make this successful and sustainable. There's a community meeting right there in what we call Little Comado. So that is like the center of the community where one of the leaders has this Comado established. She was actually the founder of the community. Can you believe that? She came there with her seven children as a, a single mom, put together a couple of pieces of tin, had a sheet, and they covered themselves night and day, with, well, at night, with palm branches to protect against mosquitoes. So as you can see here, we're digging different trenches to put in the water lines, and there's community members along with our Everyday Hope team working alongside of them. And it is a process because you've got to drill the well, excuse me, Drill the well, and also you must put up the pump house, as you can see. And we call it a process called panete. It's covered with some cement. Um, we also have holding tanks, too. And then the water is distributed twice a week to different districts of the, the community. So now, where they used to get and hope 
for, to gather rainwater from a rusty tin roof or go and collect contaminated water from a river or wait on a water truck to arrive, which many times they don't. Now they have running water right to their homes. Praise the Lord. There's no more worry and concern about where the water is going to come from. And I had heard, too, the community leader tell me, she goes, you know what, this is really going to improve the health of the children. So many are sick. So many are sick because of those waterborne diseases in the water. So there's Nancy right there with Jim. We did a ribbon cutting ceremony. We had an inauguration. And the community asked us, please, can you please hold a church service with the inauguration as well? We need the hope that Jesus has to offer. And so since that time, actually, the, one of the community leaders, is, well, many of them, have come up to me and said, you know what, Pastora, it is amazing what's happened since you've all been here. Because, you know, we spent weeks there, months there, and just in the investigation process and then weeks and just putting in these trenches and pipelines and distribution system. They said the hunger for the Lord is growing. And so, yeah, isn't that awesome? And they're actually praying now for God to build a church in their community. Yay! Yay, so you've been a part of that spirit of life. Thank you so much. Now I want to also talk to you about another area. See, we, we went to the Dominican Republic and started with everyday ministries where we're strengthening pastors and leaders and strengthening the churches. We've strengthened women through Deborah Generation. We've done this humanitarian work with clean water projects and small business training and, and things as such. But God just keeps evolving this ministry. Vision and mission are the same. So I'm just focusing on two aspects today. So don't lose heart. We're still doing all those other things. I just want to share with you two specific stories. So you heard about the water project. Well, we were singing this worship, worship song today, and it said, check your shame at the door. It's not welcome here anymore. Oh, it just hit me. This program that we're doing now called Daughters of Hope is doing that with these girls, and I'm going to explain a little bit. So I told you that we work with women, and there's a ministry called Deborah Generation Ministry where we are strengthening women. Well, I have seen such growth in these ladies. It's been so rewarding to see that. And we have begun community projects ourselves to reach those that are unreached. In the Dominican Republic, let me tell you, there is a crisis going on. 55% of newborn babies are born to girls between 13 and 18. These girls don't have resources. We're talking about the poorest of the poor. And they're carrying a lot of shame. And they're carrying rejection. And they've been abandoned many times. So the ladies of Deborah Generation and myself, we started this program in 2019 called Daughters of Hope, speaking hope into their lives, providing training. You can go ahead and show those pictures. Providing training, um, preparing them for motherhood, helping them to have healthy babies, um, helping with family planning and planning for the future. Here's one of the mothers here with her little boy. This mother's name is Leilani. And she graduated from our five-month program and then went into the Mommy and Me program because that's the next step. We follow these mothers and children for the first year. We provide opportunities for play, for bonding, and all the while we're educating them. All the while we're sharing Jesus. And they're actually, we're seeing that bond between mother and child deepen. We're seeing that tenderness between them. This is a young girl who didn't even know she wanted to keep the baby, okay? Right here, Leilani herself, she was, she was terrified. She was scared, wondering, what am I going to do? And so I want to share with you a little story from her. And I want to tell you a little secret, too. Since her time in the program of Daughters of Hope, and now being involved as, with Mommy and Me and bringing her little son there and, and growing, she actually has received Christ as her Savior. Praise the Lord. And she's also a volunteer encouraging other young moms in her community and working alongside of us. So I want to just share a little, uh, just a testimony from her because she comes into our program of Daughters of Hope and meets with girls in the community. And this is the story that she shares with them. It's a letter she write, wrote to them. Are you ready? Okay. So let me grab it here. All right. Okay. So this is Leilani. My name is Leilani. You can go ahead and show the next picture of Leilani. And I attended the Daughters of Hope class of 2021. I first give thanks to God for allowing me to be a part of this marvelous organization, Daughters of Hope. I want to give testimony of how my life has changed. I found out about this organization through a community leader. I'm so grateful to her for introducing me because my pregnancy was very difficult and there were many challenges. When I arrived at Daughters of Hope, I immediately felt accepted. 
I felt chosen and hopeful when they received me and spoke into my life. It was just like the name says, I am a daughter of hope. Oh, praise God. I realized then the pain I had been experiencing, and I realized there's something much bigger than my problems. This is what the people of this organization give to us. They give us unconditional support, counsel, and teachings. There were things about my pregnancy I didn't know how I would handle, but with their help, I could continue and be confident. I'm a confident person now, but I remember the pain I felt. This has been a life-changing experience. This is what they give to us. I am so grateful for each of them for giving me this unconditional love, the important workshops and teachings. There are things I never imagined. I feel solid, like I can face things and the challenges. Sounds like she checked her shame at the door, amen? Today, I can say that my child has not just me as a mother, but also those of Daughters of Hope. That touches my heart so much. I first thank God and then Daughters of Hope. Really, I encourage each of you to go to participate. Let them know what you need and any questions you have. You can count on them. There will be things you don't know how you're going to do, but talk with them. They are your family. They are my family, too. Whatever you don't know or understand, they are there for you. I am too. I am a young mom too, and I am here for you as well. Does that sound like a life transformed? Oh, and you're a part of that by supporting everyday ministry, ministries, by supporting everyday hope, by supporting us being on the field. You get to share in that harvest too, so thank you. And if you want to learn any more about the water project or how we go about things or any more about the ministry will be available afterwards. We are currently in some fundraising, in the fundraising mode. Um, God has really challenged us. Um, he said, we're supposed to ask for money for three wells and also money for Daughters of Hope. So that means each well costs $30,000, okay? But again, that'll give, provide water for, for 30 to 40 families, all right? And we have, also have to look for $10,000 for Daughters of Hope. It has actually duplicated since we began in 2019. So there's actually women with Deborah Generation working on the north coast of the country while I'm working on the south coast. We've got two Daughters of Hope pro program going and then one Mommy and Me program. So yes, $100,000 is what the Lord told us to ask for. And so we're believing in faith that he's going to do it. It's his ministry. Amen. The provision will be there. Praise the Lord. So be praying into that, please. And now I'd like to introduce to you one of my favorite preachers of all time, my dear and amazing husband. Pastor James Larson. James. James Larson. James Larson. Wow, only my mother did that. Good morning. Oh, that's pathetic. Good morning. That's better. Awesome. We are so excited to be here today. I can't even tell you how much. Thank you very much for all of your support for all the, over all the years. And you need to know you're helping 27 families, and eight more will be on the project by next year. That's 35 families that receive water. And because of your donation, that's happening. Okay, give yourself a round of applause. I'm, uh, I'm very elated and honored to be standing at this pulpit. I don't take this lightly ever, because this is God's, not yours, this is God's, and I feel very honored to be here. I'm also very, very excited because I haven't seen my son and my daughter-in-law in almost a year, and uh, I'm very excited they're here today. So um, I was thinking when we were getting prayed for this morning um, by a group from the church, how lucky we are to come to a house of the Lord freely Really, I mean, there are places in the world that you get killed to do this. But we get to come here freely. It's, it's not something we should take for granted. It's really not. We get to come here and sing praises and pray and lift each other up all for one thing. Christ. And the older I get, I am convinced. I am convinced there is only one thing we live for, and that's Christ. There is nothing else. When we leave here, we check out, nothing goes with us. Only what we've done for him. Amen? I'd like everybody to stand for a minute. I just want to pray for this morning. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather here in your house, the house that you built. 
And Lord, I pray this morning that, that the Holy Spirit has free reign here this morning. And Lord, that hearts are, are pierced with your word this morning. And lives are more dedicated to you this morning. Relationships are bonded together this morning. And that you have freedom here. May the words that are spoken here this morning, Lord, edify each other, but mostly edify you. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Bless our time. In the awesome name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So what I'd like to talk about this morning is, is your faith evolving? I had, I had a message that I had prepared to give, and God told me, I don't want you to do that. And I'm like, no, I spent all this time, and, and, and I wrote it all out, and I studied it, and I'm ready. And he said, no, I, I want you to give this message. So don't blame me, blame him. So I want to talk about, is your faith evolving? I'm not talking about evolution. I'm not talking about, you know, were we pond scum and then evolved to who we are. I'm talking about, is your dedication today with Jesus Christ greater than it was six months ago, a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago? Is it greater today than it was back then? Have you evolved in your relationship with him? Has it grown deeper? To evolve, it says, to develop gradually from a simple form to a more complex form. So I want to talk about a couple things that have evolved over the years. Let's talk about phones. Now, when I was a kid, I was about 15, then that's about 20 years ago. We had a phone on a wall. Everybody, anybody remember those? Oh, yeah, all right, good. Okay, and so our family only had a cord about this long, so you had to stay next to the... Now, if your family was really cool, you had about a 15-foot cord, and you could talk and walk around. and, Huh? Yeah. That was back a long time ago, and I'm not going to tell you how long ago. Now today, we have this. It's evolved. It's went from something simpler to definitely something more complex. I mean, you can do everything on this thing. I don't, I don't know how to do everything on this thing. My wife's up there using this, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I, I would mess that up seriously. But you can do everything on it. What about cars? Back in 1908, when, when Henry Ford put the car out, you got in front of the car, and you cranked it up like this. Then you got in the car, you started it, drove to your destination. When you shut the car off, you had to crank the car up again and start it and go. Today, one of the fastest legal production cars on the road in the United States is called a Bugatti. A Bugatti Veyron. It can go 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds. Oh, my. So if you want to buy a missionary gift, you know, think about that. I would take it, humbly, of course. But think about that. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. 2.5 seconds. That's evolved. It's gone from something simple to a rocket. Do you remember when you were first a Christian? I want you to think back. If you sit in this house today and you're a Christian. I want you to think back when you were first a Christian. And I only can speak from, from how I felt, but it was like my pants were on fire. I couldn't tell people fast enough how great Christ was, how awesome he is. Have you read the book? This guy's amazing. Do you still feel that way today? Is your faith evolving? Are you growing deeper with your Savior? You know, the Bible states 91 times to serve the Lord, serve each other, or to be a servant. 
91 times. I'm, I think he's got a message there. And you see, we serve a, a, a very jealous God, an incredibly jealous God. His first two commandments, have no other gods before me and do not create for yourself an idol. And you might be sitting here and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't have an idol. Really? I'm not picking on you. I'm not condemning you. Because God gave me this for me first before I could give it. Do you spend as much time with the Lord as you do on this? I can't answer that. But I know there's some days I don't, and that's wrong. You know, sometimes we think that um, we stand before the Lord someday, and we think it's like the game Family Feud. Has everybody heard of Family Feud before? Is that even still on the air? Yeah. But the Lord will say, what are the top three answers on the board on how you serve me? And you'll say, well, you know, I, I went to church once a month. And your relatives won't be there going, good answer, good answer, good answer. They're not going to do that. It doesn't work like that. You see, we serve a jealous God that wants every ounce of you all the time. All the time. Luke 14 Chapter 14, or chapter 14, verse 25 and 26 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Think about that. Those are not my words. Those are his now, do you actually think God wants you to hate your spouse and hate your children? Of course not. That's not what he's saying here. But he is saying, am I the most important aspect of your life? Because if I'm not, you're not allowed to be my disciple. He, we serve a jealous God. He wants, like I said, he wants all of you. He has to be first all the time. All the time. So if we're going to be evolve in our faith, and we're going to grow deeper with the Lord, I think we need to do three things. First, we need to study God's word. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about you have to spend 10 hours in the Bible a day. That's not what I'm talking about. But we need to be students of his word, because how can you defend his kingdom if you don't know what the book says? Amen. You can't fix your car unless you had the owner's manual, especially today. <laughs> Amen? Amen. So, in or, so we have to study God's word. We have to spend time with him. We have to talk to him. We have to examine his word and put those words upon our heart and apply them to our lives. The second thing is we need to recognize our call. And you see, you all are called. And we'll get back to that later because that's my favorite part of this message. And then thirdly, you must apply action to your call. Because faith without works is dead. So we have to study God's word because he wants all of you, not some of you. Deuteronomy 6.13 says, Fear the Lord your God, serve him only. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24 says, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all of your heart, not just some of your heart. 2 Chronicles 19.9 says, You must serve faithfully and wholeheartedly. Luke chapter 4, verse 8 says, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. If you're going to be a defender of his kingdom, you got to know who you're defending. Amen? Amen? I mean, if you're a fan of a football team, and I'm, I'm not going to pick football teams today because my daughter-in-law's here. 
She's a big Packer fan, and I'm not, but that's a whole other story. <clears throat> um, you know the team. You know them well. You study them. When they play and they score a touchdown, we go out of our skin. Are you out that on fire for the Lord? Are you studying his word as much as you study the box scores of the Packers? I'm not picking on you because I love sports. But he has to come first. He has to. You're not going to stand before the general manager of the Packers or any other club you want to pick. I'm not picking on the Packers. Pick one. You don't stand before them. You stand before him and only him. Only him. So I'm encouraging you to spend time with the Lord. Just spend time. Hang out with him. Read his book. Study it. Apply those to your heart and live them. Revelation chapter 3, and this is a very sec scary section of scripture. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you'd be either hot or cold because if you're lukewarm, I will spew you from my mouth. And I have been guilty of this in my life, so please understand I'm not picking on anyone. But it's, the word is saying, I'd rather have you cold and not interested in me than sitting on a fence and pretending sometimes I love you and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I want to spend time with you, and other times, frankly, I don't want to. But God wants us to be hot. He wants us to be on fire. He wants us to be that new Christian that your pants are on fire and you've got to tell everybody. And you know, you don't have to stand, as my father would have said, you don't have to stand on a soapbox in the middle of a park. No. You just have to show people what Jesus looks like. This is what he looks like. And love on him. Amen? Amen. Okay. Oh, wait a sec. Okay. We have to recognize our call. You all have a call. And you might be sitting here going, ah, you're crazy. I don't have a call. God didn't build me like that. Yeah, he did. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lonely things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. You're qualified. I'm telling you right now, you're, you're, you're qualified. You are so qualified. Each one of you is tremendously gifted. And you might say, well, I'm not Michael Jordan. No. I'm not Wayne Gretzky. No. I'm not Tom Brady. I mean, Aaron Rodgers. No. But each one of you has a gift that they don't have. But because they're on the TV and in the sports page and everywhere else, we compare ourselves. We don't compare ourselves to them. We compare ourselves to him. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you all have gifts that you don't even realize. You do. And you all have a sphere of influence that only you can touch. Nobody else. You don't, you don't have to be a missionary in the Dominican Republic. You have to be a missionary somewhere, whether it's at work or your neighborhood or your friends or your family. Pick one, but you have a mission field, and you have the gifts and the knowledge. If you sit in this building this morning and Christ is your Savior, you have the knowledge of what happens in the end. And we have to share that because that's the only hope we have. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling. You see, your gifts and talents aren't yours. They're on loan. He has given them to you. Your calling is his calling to reach the people that he puts in your life. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling. Ephesians chapter 4 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. You see, God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. And I'm going to tell you something. I can, I'm a living example of that. You see, about 19 years ago, I thought it would be a really good idea when we got news of missionaries needed in the Dominican Republic. I'd never been a missionary. I had never been on a mission trip. I had never been to the Dominican Republic. But I heard God say, go. And I'm like, yeah, you want me to pack my family up and sell everything and go? Yeah, I want you to do that. So I told my wife, and she did the wifely thing and said, I'll pray about it. But we went, and my son can attest to this. Landed in the Dominican Republic, had never been there. Eight hockey bags, four carry-ons, and no place to live. But because we did that, look what God did. You see, we, we weren't qualified to do this. I'm telling you right now, we are not qualified to do this. The only Spanish I knew was uno, dos, tres. And I barely knew that. But look what God did. God has done incredible things through two kids from Minnesota that said yes. God's looking for your yes. He's showing you your call and he's saying just say yes. I'll work out the details. And he did. Crazy ride, but he did. And then you have to apply action to your call. And Paul was talking to Timothy, and this is the reason we apply action. When Paul was talking to Timothy, this is what he said. 1 Timothy chapter 2. God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. You see, you know the truth. If you sit in this building this morning and you call yourself a Christian, you have been called because you signed up when you said yes. When you said, yes, Lord, I want you on my head, well, guess what? You signed up. You're called. And now he wants to, you to apply action. Like I said, you all have a sphere of influence. You all, come on, we all have family and friends that aren't serving the Lord, amen? Okay, there's one mission field. You work with people that don't know the Lord. That's, that's mission field number two. You live in a community, in a neighborhood, they don't know Jesus. There's another mission field. What is he calling you to do? And you don't have to stand behind a pulpit to be the missionary. You just simply have to love on your family, stand up and live as Christ would live, and you're the example. Because they're all watching. They know you go to church, they know what you believe in, they're watching. Show them what Jesus looks like. Love on them. That's action to your call. James chapter 2 says... If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. I wasn't going to share this this morning, but I feel I need to do that. That water project that you were part of, where 27 families are getting water, that's a physical Need. You see, you go home in, in the United States and places in the Dominican Republic, you turn on the tap and you have water. Amen? Amen. 
Some places you can actually drink the water. In the Dominican Republic, you cannot drink that. But you use it for domestic use water, cleaning the house, bathing in. That was a physical need that you met. And because that physical need was met, the whole community's heart went, whoom, to the kingdom of Christ. It wasn't because we were preaching him. It was because they knew what we stood for, and we loved on them, and you provided a physical need. And they went, whoom. They talk about Jesus Every time I'm there, I'm guessing they didn't talk about him before at all. They want a church in their community. That's action. Amen? Amen. You don't have to put a well on somebody's property. You just need to show them what Jesus looks like. Matthew chapter 28 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Pick a nation. Your neighborhood is a nation. Place you work as a nation. Just pick a nation. I want to share a story from the Bible that um, has rocked my world for years. And I, uh, I, think about it, I think about it often. And so I want to share that with you this morning. It comes out of Luke chapter 16. See, there was a, and I'm just going to paraphrase it. I'm not going to read it. There was a, a really rich guy. He had everything. Great clothes. Beautiful home, best food in the nation. And there was, a be- there was a beggar that sat at his gate begging for food. His name was Lazarus. In fact, it said that the guy was so poor and so beat up physically, he had sores all over his body that only the dogs would come up to him and they would lick his sores. And once in a while, the rich man, he would give him scraps off his table and give them to him. They both died at the same time. Lazarus, he goes to heaven. Met by Abraham. The rich man, he goes to hell. And it says that Abraham was comforting Lazarus and the rich man could see them. So that means people in hell can see people in heaven. Think about that for a minute. Seriously, think about that for a minute. And the rich man goes, Father Abraham, please, please please send Lazarus back so he can dip his finger in water and put it on my tongue. I am dying here. Abraham says, I I can't send him back. I can't. It's not allowed. You see, when you lived, you had all the riches in the world, and Lazarus had nothing. And besides that, between us is a great chasm a great space. And Lazarus can't go there, and you can't come here. Think about that. Because that is extremely, extremely scary in my eyes. See, God, I'm not trying, this isn't a brim, fire and brimstone sermon. This is simply how I feel. We have one chance in life, one, to make it right to serve him, because at the end, that's all you have. And how are you going to feel if you make it to heaven and then you see all the people God put in your life and they're on the other side? Because you didn't have enough guts to say something. You were embarrassed to say something. You see, the word says, if you acknowledge me here, I will acknowledge you before the Father. And if you deny me here, I'll deny you before the Father. Those aren't my words. I want you to think about this. My son will like this because I've used this demonstration a lot. But it means a lot to me. And God gave it to me and I feel um, 
it's very important for people to see. This is what I think is going to happen when we pass away. You're going to, the Bible says that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So you die and St. Peter, he meets you at the gate. And he says, well, come on in. Jesus has been expecting you. Sit right here. And Jesus will be with you in a moment. Whoa, how are you going to feel there? Knees are going to be shaking. Palms are going to be sweating. Jesus is going to come in and say, well, I've been expecting you. Play the film. You know, what film? Oh, it's the film of your life. We're going to see what you did for my kingdom. It's quiet in here. I think one of two things would, what is going to happen. One, either you're going to hang your head and say, Lord, I, I, I failed. You gave me all kinds of opportunities, and I, and I, and I failed. Send me back. There are no backs. Or you have the choice to serve him well, and when that video is playing, you're going to stand on your seat and you're going to say, I rock! Look what I did for your kingdom! You see, it's not too late. It's not. You're not in this chair yet. He wants all of you. Not just part of you. Now, I can't actually tell you this is biblical. But God pressed this on my heart about 10 years ago, and I use it a lot because I think it's impactful. Because I'm worried that when I sit there, I want my father to say, well done. I got the greatest Harley Davidson for you and the greatest golf course. Come on in and enjoy them. It's, this is my dream, no? <laughs> it's your choice. It's your choice to go to Dairy Queen today or not. It's a choice. It's your choice of what you eat for dinner tonight. Your choice. It's your choice if you love your wife dearly. Your choice. It's your choice if you love your children more than life itself. Your choice. And it's your choice to serve your father, the creator of who you are. It's your choice. And I tell you right now, according to the Bible that I read, we get one shot and we will stand before him. And I just want the best for you. I want you to rock his kingdom. I want Fond du Lac to change because of you. Next time I come back here, I want to see thousands in here, not because of the church and how great it is, but because they know Christ is here. And they knew, and he knows his servants, that you went out and served him. Because this isn't church. This is a building. Church is this. We're church. You bring church wherever you go. Church doesn't stop when you leave the door. Church starts when you leave the door. This is where you go. It's, a, it's a, like a gas station. You come here, you fuel up, you sharpen each other, you encourage one another. You're there for one another. I told my wife at, when, sir, when the worship team started, I said, there's such a great sense of camaraderie here that I don't feel in every church, and I'm not just saying that. I really sense that you love each other. So this is where you go to fill up, encourage one another, and then you go to church. Amen? So I want to do this this morning. If you want to serve the Lord better, if you want to answer your call, if you want to apply action to your call, I want you to stand. This isn't just something you came here to say. And I don't want you just to do this because the good-looking missionary guy said stand. 
I want you to do it <clears throat> because this is an agreement between you and him, not you and me. I'm not qualified. That's way above my job description. You have gifts, talents, anointings that no one else has. Don't compare yourself to each other. Encourage each other. Because the people you reach, he can't reach. And the people you reach, he can't reach. And the people you reach, she can't reach. He puts you in the place where you're at. I encourage you to be dedicated to him so all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, that you are incredibly awesome and jealous of your children. You love them all so much. And I pray, Lord, as they stand before you, that you will reveal to them their mission field, whether it's family, friends, co-workers, a foreign country, whatever it is. That you show them the door that you've had open for them and that you will fling it wide open and they will not miss it. And they will have the courage to walk through those doors and defend your kingdom. And Lord, I pray that over each one that they will know and they will sense your presence wherever you send them. I thank you, Lord, for each heart that stands before you. I pray that the, your hand is upon them. I pray that you will guide them and direct them. I pray, Lord, as they spend time with you, you just pour all kinds of wisdom in them. I pray, Lord, that you will anoint them beyond whatever they thought they could be anointed. And I pray when they walk in a room... People sense the presence of our Almighty Father and that you give them way more courage than they ever thought they could do. And Lord, they will impact this community, their families, their friends, their co-workers, and that you will bring a lot of people into your kingdom through them. I thank you, Lord, for this morning, this time to be together. Bless each one their marriages, their children, their homes, their businesses. Let them know, Lord, that you're in the details. And it's in the awesome name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Pastor Jay. I invite you to be seated for just a few moments. I'm going to ask the ushers if they will come forward and give you an opportunity to bless the Larsons. We call this a love offering. Everything that you give this morning here in-house, if you're watching online, uh, you can give unto their projects to them via our Tithely app, our PayPal app on our website, Tyler, you can download. Uh, many of you use that. Uh, you can also, if you're not able to give today to them, uh, you can give it later on this week because everything that we will receive today uh, will go through the church and then send to them. That's their preference uh, and it just keeps good records of everything that's going on. But uh, your heart should be stirred of what has happened because of your giving, your dedication, your faithfulness. When I've been overseas, I'm not re-preaching, I'm just making a statement. I, I've been there to where the water we were bathing in could not enter your nose or your ears because of the bacteria and the parasites. I've been there to where uh, you were grateful for boiled rice at the end of the day because there wasn't much of anything else to eat being overseas. I know some of you just thought, well, you must have ate good since you've been back. Yes, I have. So 
I'm just seeing if any of you is awake. But give this morning. Give unto the Lord, unto ministry. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, I ask again that you give unto them a blessing for their hearts to be able to give. God, as we give, Lord, we ask, that, Lord, through your mighty, miraculous touch that, God, it's pressed down and overflowing, God, that we see the abundance of what blessings are. So, God, find us faithful as we give this morning. Amen and amen. As they pass amongst you, I said earlier, if you were a guest, there's a green card. If I didn't, I'm saying it now. If you're a guest, there's a green card. If you'll fill that out, uh, we won't bug you. We just want to be connected to you. You can put it in the back in the joy box and just know that uh, we'll reach out, be a part of some email, and we don't bug you. It's once a week that we send an email out. But I'm going to ask Jim and Renee to stand. And before we start leaving out, I want you to just point your hands toward them. Let it be an extension. And Heavenly Father, right now, we ask that, Lord, what they do, Lord, we know they do it unto you. God, it's about who you are and, and the righteousness of who you are, God, that they fulfill the call on their life for kingdom work. So, Lord, we pray for them to see financial blessing come where all needs are met. Lord, we pray for them physically that they will stay healthy as they uh, stay the course in working for you, Lord. We ask, God, that you surround them with great and mighty influence of workers and servants' hearts. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that in what we're able to do, Lord, through their hands in another country, God, that uh, we'll see the lives changed. Lord, you called some of us to go, and you called some of us to send. So, Lord, we send them back into the, to, into the field, Lord, as Renee made mention. Lord, you laid it upon their heart for 100,000. God, I ask that you fulfill that in your precious and most holy name. Amen. And amen. Before you stand and run, they're going to walk out. They're going to stand by their table. Feel free to ask them any questions. I know there's a clipboard to put your email and phone numbers if you want some uh, contact with them. But uh, I know that God is uh, hes a good, good father, isn't he? So God bless you all. In Jesus' name, you're dismissed.